This is a seminar organised under the auspices of Professor Tim Jackson's Sustainable Lifestyles Research Group, um, which, we, which we do occasionally, alternating with the, the CES seminars. And one of the um, most interesting projects in that whole programme, which is funded by DEFRA and the Scottish Government, you're going to hear about from Emily Creamer, who's come all the way down from the University of Edinburgh. So, welcome, Emily. Thanks very much for, mm. for joining us. She's been doing work, um, intensive field work, in two communities in remote rural Scotland. So it's often a neglected theme looking at rural communities in relation to sustainable living to try and tease out some of the, the, um, the tensions and the, the factors which might promote sustainable living but also act as barriers to it in, in that kind of community. And we think this is one of the most interesting in-depth pieces of, of ethnographic work we, 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 we've had in the, in the last few years. Um, in CS and in its partner network. So we're looking forward to hearing from you, Emily. Uh, this is work in progress, as she will stress, um, but there are already some really fascinating issues coming out. And um, in the audience, we have Alexia Kokash, I'll draw attention to Alexia, who's finishing her doctorate on transition towns and the dynamics of, of, of their memberships and community links. So there, there may well be some, some nice interplay there. Mm -hmm. but you're very welcome to speak. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Hello. Um, yes, I am Emily, and uh, I am doing so mine's uh, one of two PhDs that are in uh, SLG, um, and I've just gone into my third year. So I've done the bulk of my um, research, my kind of field work, um, still got a little bit of interview to, to do, but um, what I'm going to do today is give you, I've never had this much time to speak about my PhD, so I'm going to indulge myself and tell you um, a lot about my PhD in general, and then um, try and talk a little bit about the paper that I'm trying to write at the moment, which is this double edged sort of grant funding um, for community. Uh, initiatives. Um, so this is kind of the outline of what I'm going to talk about today. So I'll just go over my aims um, and the rationale behind those aims. Uh, a bit of the background to uh, what, what Remote Rural Scotland is and how we define it. And uh, looking and also tell you a little bit about the specific policy mechanism that I'm looking at, which is the Climate Challenge Fund. Um, then I'll talk about my methodology. Um, I'll give you a little insight into kind of some of the observations I've obviously got. That you'll see from my methodology I have uh, produced a lot of observations, it's all um, ethnographic, so I have a lot, but I'll just give you a little uh, flavour of that. And then kind of my first uh, concept that has come out of my analysis, which is this double-edged sword uh, theory, which I'll go into in detail, and then a couple of other things that are kind of starting to emerge, um, and then I'll come to questions. So these are my two aims, um, very broad, which is kind of purposeful, as you'll see from I'm using a grounded theory approach. Um, so they, the first one is just to understand Really what sustainable lifestyles means within remote rural Scotland, and I'll go into a little bit more about that in a minute. And the second one is uh, looking specifically at the role of what's classified as community-led initiatives, um, which is something that's quite widely promoted as a way to encourage people to become more sustainable, so I really want to look into that in more detail. Um, so just to explain a little bit more about why I've chosen these two aims. Um, so the first one really came from the idea that uh, sustainability, sustainable development is a very fluid um, concept that is open to interpretation um, and obviously that's also true of sustainable lifestyles um, and the way, they like, the way that sustainable lifestyles is interpreted uh, depends on uh, your values, your motivations, your attitudes and that's very kind of context specific so depending on where you grow up you probably have different uh, values and attitudes towards things and so kind of the translation from uh, understanding what sustainable means into putting it into, ac into action is um, it depends where you live, basically, that's kind of my, my theory. And so I want to look at that in remote rural Scotland. Um, remote rural Scotland, or remote rural areas in general, are particularly interesting um, because they're purported to have uh, very high levels of social capital, uh, which is thought to be quite an important prerequisite to uh, encouraging people to become more sustainable. Um, so I kind of want to really uh, explore that um, within these settings. And also, there's a very particular culture in remote rural Scotland and I'm interested in kind of the interplay of, between that and sustainability. Um, and the second one, um, like I said, community-led initiatives are quite widely promoted as a way to encourage uh, sustainable living and um, one of the advocates of this supposedly is the Scottish Government who set up this Climate Challenge Fund um, which is the mechanism through which money is provided to community-level organisations um, to lower their carbon footprint and so I'm looking at that in particular, um, and um, how the community, how kind of the, the collaborative groups that come out of that, how they work and how they fit into the wider network of 
collaborative working that's already going on kind of traditionally in these um, communities, um, which, you know, this collaborative working is uh, kind of why they're thought to have high levels of social capital. And so it's kind of how all this fits together and how, how well these new community groups represent the community that they supposedly represent. So that, that's what I'm trying to find out. So, um, just to fill you in on exactly what is Remote Rural Scotland, this is Scotland. Um, <laughs> and this is the, as you can see, Scottish Government classification of uh, urban and rural. Anything on this map that's light coloured, so yellow or light green, that is Remote Rural Scotland. Um, apart from within there, you probably can't see, but there's a few kind of clusters of population. So this, this light colour, that's anything that has the whole of Scotland that has a population of under 3,000 people and is uh, further than half an hour's drive from a settlement of 10,000 people or more. So all of this, apart from, you can see a few hotspots, so you've got like Lowick and Kirkwall and I think there's Wick there, Stornoway, uh, Fort William and Oban. But apart from that, all of this is from right across Scotland. So most of Scotland is my study area. 7% um, of the population, and most of the natural resources, of course, um, so these people can, are the guardians of the natural resources of Scotland. Um, so that's why it's interesting to me, because it's very understudied um, relative to its size. Um, it's also interesting, as I said, it's meant to have high levels of social capital, so I'm quite interested in kind of exploring whether that is the case, and like I said, how that interface with the idea of sustainability. And um, also, although there is no data for the whole of remote rural Scotland, to kind of say whether this is or isn't the case, it's kind of assumed that people living here probably have a slightly larger carbon footprint than their urban counterparts um, because of the distances between people and things and so things have to be transported a long way and people have to be transported so they need they rely on their car more than maybe people in cities do um, need to import and export things from the islands um, also the uh, infrastructure uh, tends to be, or the housing particularly tends to be older you don't get kind of new builds of high-rise flats, which are all wonderfully um, insulated and energy efficient. So there's quite a lot of old kind of cottages which um, seep heat all the time, which are hard to retrofit. Um, also, uh, socio-economically speaking, this, these areas are uh, under a lot of pressure. Uh, obviously, agriculture is a big part of their economy, and that's uh, in decline. Um, and so, employment opportunities are dwindling. Uh, young people are moving out, uh, looking for. Um, education or training and then uh, finding jobs elsewhere and not coming back and so there's quite a big problem with an aging population in a lot of these places. Um, uh, the investment in infrastructure isn't great so um, public services like um, public transport, buses and train services don't exist in some places and where they do they're a bit patchy. So just generally quite interested in this area um, and then specifically what I'm looking at is the role of the Climate Challenge Fund. Um, so the Climate Challenge Fund was set up in 2008. I don't know how much you know about uh, Scottish politics, but uh, the SNP at that point had a minority government, so they had to form a coalition uh, with some of the other parties. And one of the ways they got the Green Party, the Scottish Green Party on board, was to agree to the Climate Challenge Fund, which is a very green idea, which is to provide money for community scale projects to reduce their carbon footprint. And that can be anything. It can be anything from uh, making a building more energy efficient to um, buying a bit of land to grow vegetables on or buying some bikes for the local people to uh, rent. Um, so it can be li literally anything. You just have to prove that you are part of a community group and you fill in an application form and they decide whether or not you get the money. Um, and it's basically worked out as about £10 million pounds a year um, since 2008 that's been provided and they have, since they got their majority government, um, they've decided to extend it. So um, it became very popular, um, a vote winner, some people might say, um, amongst certain people. So um, the SNP decided to extend it to 2015. And so by that time they'd have invested uh, about 70 million pounds in this project. So again, I'm interested in kind of whether it's working, I suppose, and um, how it's working really, and um, how this really um, what it looks like in real life. Okay, so the way I'm going to do that, um, because I'm I'm looking for kind of deep, rich data rather than um, universal. You know, I'm not trying to find out what sustainable living means in general. I'm, I'm really interested in these specific areas, and so I'm taking a, a case study approach. Um, so I've picked two um, communities which um, are currently in receipt of CCF funding. So they've got a group that is active at the moment and has ongoing CCF funding. Um, and once I found them, 
I went and lived there for two months, uh, volunteered full time um, with the organisation, um, did whatever they wanted me to do, <laughs> within reason, and, um, uh, and just watched everything that went on. Uh, I had a, a research journal, that was the main way that I recorded my data, so I, um, in both cases I ended up being based in the office most of the time, for reasons that I'll go into later, um, and so it was quite easy for me just to have my laptop open and I could just uh, take notes all through the day, uh, which means I had a lot of notes by the end of uh, two months. Um, and also, once I'd kind of been there for a while, I then uh, set up some interviews with people who had got to know. So the idea was I'd kind of built a level of trust and maybe they uh, felt more relaxed around me and so they kind of opened up a bit more. Um, I was able to kind of probe them a little bit on the things that I'd observed. Um, and so it, was, it really allows you to kind of get beneath the surface of kind of what people consciously know about their everyday life and it's kind of you get this um, it's called an insider and outsider perspective. So although I uh, am not part of the community for a couple of months, I kind of am to an extent. Um, and it was very much open. Some people, there was no covert uh, spying people at all. Uh, I went there beforehand and everything was agreed. They knew what my project was and uh, the group uh, were happy to have me there and help me out um, as much as they could. And so the approach, like I said, is a grounded theory approach. So I didn't construct any hypotheses of what I was expecting to find before I got there. Um, the idea was grounded theory. I should say it's not an orthodox grounded theory method approach. So I'm not, you probably will find holes in the way that I've done it in terms of what Glazer and Strauss would maybe um, say you have to do. But I've taken kind of grounded theory as the foundation of how I've built my methodology, um, which is basically I went in there and allowed my uh, hypotheses to emerge from my observations. Um, so I, as you start, after a few days you start to notice things and you start to uh, start to, uh, to theorise about certain things and then you kind of go in the next few days and you see whether that is true and slowly over time you should hopefully <laughs> develop some idea, you know, some theory about what's going on. Um, and so uh, this quote, you know, it's just kind of meant to be a very kind of organic process of um, developing a theory based on reality. Okay, so the two case studies, um, I'm not going to tell you exactly where they are, um, because although I did get um, consent uh, from the, the groups I was with, due to the nature of my observations, <coughs> it's uh, impossible to get consent from everybody that you, you were to hear a conversation with, and so just so I don't offend anybody and no one thinks I'm doing them a disservice, um, I'll keep them anonymous as much as I can, although you probably can find out who they are. <laughs> um, so the first one was an island. I was there last winter, which wasn't as bad as you might think. <laughs> it was um, it was probably about like this most of the time. Um, population of uh, just under fifteen hundred people. And these are just some facts, just to kind of give you a flavour of what the place is like. So you can see there, uh, about sixty percent of the population speak Gaelic, compared to the national average of one percent. So pretty much all the Gaelic speakers live um, here. <laughs> and um, uh, fishing is still quite a big industry out there, uh, compared again to the national average, I think pretty much all the fishermen live there. Um, and this is kind of just to see whether the theory of more people owning a car, you can see slightly more people do uh, own a car, um, but not massively so. But that's probably more testament to the fact that everybody owns a car now anyway. Um, and the CCF group that I was um, working with, they received uh, just under a quarter of a million pounds over two years. Um, and that was mainly for um, a set of two different types of trials. So one was looking at, like I said, these old style cottages um, are very hard to insulate in retrofit. So they had a, a project where they were trying to figure out new ways of insulating them. And the other one was uh, growing trials. So the soils here are quite poor and it's quite difficult um, to know which crops will work the best. And so they did a, a series of growing trials to try and inform local people what would be the best thing for them to grow at home. Um, and then they had various other additional things that kind of supported that. And the second one was in contrast with the lowland uh, case study. So this is uh, just north of the border between England and Scotland. Um, I did, went there in uh, spring of this year. And um, slightly bigger population, very different settlement. So the island's a very linear settlement, very spread out, um, whereas this is very much a clustered settlement around a high street. Um, you can see here, we've got a high retiree influx, so um, much more pensioners here than the national average. Um, this is just to show you quite a few people do migrate here, mainly from England, because it's just north of the border, like I said, so uh, less people born in Scotland than the national average. Um, and it's also got a thriving tourist industry, it's kind of a, a pit stop on the way to the highlands, 
uh, for people coming up from England. And so a lot of people avoid um, kind of hotel and restaurant business. Um, and the group here had been running for a bit longer and received nearly £600,000 um, from the CCF. Um, and their main project, they've converted this old um, fire station, I think it was, into a recycling shed. And what they did was they went around and collected um, cans and cardboard and paper and brought them back here, uh, crushed up the cans, um, bailed the cardboard and then sold it to somebody to recycle. Um, and then they also had a big garden where they offered um, community allotments for a small fee and uh, they also had uh, kind of growing demonstrations so they, like, similar to the last one, they would show what things grew well and you know, give people ideas. And they also had a, a quite a big furniture restoration business really that they were developing. Um, yeah. So um, what I'm going to do is just present a few of my observations. Um, I'm just going to do them around my two aims, loosely, not exactly. It's quite hard to categorise the findings. But um, So this is the first aim, really, kind of trying to understand the lifestyles of the people that live here. Um, so what I've got lots of these are, the quotes I've got up, they're either from interviews or from my research journal. Some of them are quite wordy, I've tried to pick out some of the key bits, but sorry. <laughs> um, so this quote really is just um, an interview I did with a guy who um, was, uh, I was talking to him about uh, what people in the islands want from their lives and he was saying we want the same as everyone, you know, it, it used to be that we were crofters but now uh, the kids, you know, they see everyone, um, kind of, they're motivated by money now as much as anybody else is basically what he was saying and um, crofting just doesn't cut it for them anymore and they want stuff and holidays. Um, so that was interesting to me, um, kind of goes on with the idea that kind of uh, agriculture is in decline and there's a real transition in the lifestyles of the people who, who live in these areas. Um, this was an email a uh, guy I got talking to who uh, was a sheep farmer and he, he wanted to send me this message about, because I was talking to him and he was like, oh, I'll send you a message about it. And he wrote me this huge long email about um, his life and how uh, it's kind of, it really fits in with this idea. There's a lot in the literature about how the rural area, rural communities are kind of in this position between on one hand being this idyllic, wonderful place to live where it's all peace and quiet and tranquility, but then on the other hand it's actually extremely challenging and hard work to live in rural communities and so this really kind of echoed that and he was saying being a farmer is it's really hard now and um, you know there's there's so much to adapt to and um, he sees before his eyes like the farms disappear and uh, the development of the land and uh, you know land being used very differently to how it used to be and he's finding it quite tough. So, um, yeah. Um, okay, and then the second thing um, to do with sustainable lifestyles, kind of this idea of the interpretation of sustainability, is um, um, sustainability of the population. Um, the definition of people who live in these communities of sustainability is, um, is sustaining the way of life there. So, it's not about making your lifestyles more sustainable, it's about keeping people there in order to keep having a lifestyle. So, it's, it's a much more literal idea of sustainability. Um, and it, it, again, it echoes uh, this idea that all the young people are moving out and it's old people moving in and that's not sustainable. Um, they're losing people, they're losing intelligent people who um, are moving to cities and so there's no one to develop um, these rural areas. Um, and that was a common, a common theme when I spoke to people about sustainability. And then the third thing to say, this is really um, mainly from the island, is the idea of sustaining not just any lifestyle but a very particular lifestyle. Um, and the traditional culture is extremely strong still in the islands and um, they are very keen to, to maintain it and there's quite a lot of investment in uh, trying to keep it going as you saw before, 60% of the population speak Gaelic so obviously it is still very much alive um, but it has a very interesting connection with the idea of community because although in one sense this Gaelic identity really binds part of the community it's also quite um, excluding so um, if people move into the community um, who don't speak Gaelic, there isn't much effort for people to um, help them to learn. So even people who've come specifically to learn Gaelic, because obviously that's, this is um, one of the whole hands of Gaelic, they come to learn it, but then local people won't, won't talk Gaelic with them. And it's a very complex thing, and this woman I was speaking to, she was you know, saying it's, uh, she didn't really know why, but that's just the way it was. And so it's, it's quite, that was an interesting thing to observe. And then, just to run through quickly, well, the, this is really my main finding in terms of uh, the CCF group, and that is really that it's led by incomers. So, 
people within both of these communities, there was a very open acceptance that you're either an incomer or you're a local person. And that's just what it is. It's a, it's a, it's a way of identifying people. So you would say, oh, you know, I saw Mary in the shop, so Mary. Well, the income, I'm like, yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, it, I, when I first kind of noticed it, I thought it was a bit strange, but that's just the way it is, and it's not a nasty thing, although it can be sometimes. <laughs> um, and in both cases, both the groups had been uh, set up, so initiated by incomers and were managed by incomers. So the board were remaining incomers and the management were, the paid employees were remaining incomers. Um, and it's not intentional, but that's just something that I observe in the way it is. Um, and the reason for that um, was um, said by both incomers and locals, the reason was said that incomers are more suited to be on a community group. So uh, talking to an, an incomer here, uh, or incomer who's been living there for seven years, um, said that most of, the, most of the stuff that gets done is by incomers, and that's because local people don't want to, to do it. Um, because they don't want to stick their neck out, they don't, within the culture, uh, the local culture, it's um, it's not the dumb thing really to put your head, you know, to put your head up and say this is what I think should happen. Whereas the incomers don't care; they just <laughs> they'll just um, do what they think should be done. Um, and it was kind of echoed by a local person who I spoke to, who said, uh, "Yeah, incomers come in and they have new ideas, stuff we don't know about, and they're more willing to shout about it." Whereas uh, she was saying, especially older people, they don't they don't want to. Um, <laughs> Same thing, they'd rather just leave it as it is. Um, but there is a drawback, um, which is that in both um, locations there was a person who was employed by the group who was a local person. And in both cases, completely unencouraged um, by me, they, they said that if they weren't on the group, the, local, the rest of the local people wouldn't be interested in the group at all. They would have no interaction whatsoever. And it's their involvement that gives the group legitimacy. And um, encourages people to interact with them. So the first one, you know, they sell um, some of their vegetables to the local greengrocer and this guy said beforehand she didn't want anything to do with them because they're white settlers, which I'll talk about a bit later, that's just a term for incomers. Um, and the second one, he there was more saying, you know, he thought they were white settlers and um, they had no business really telling people what to do and if it wasn't for him then nobody would even know about them. So it's interesting. So, this leads me on to my paper, which is The Double Edged Sword of Grant Funding for Community Led Sustainability Initiatives. Bit of a mouthful. The title's the best bit, so, lower your expectations. Um, okay, so there's really four elements to this. And the, the, the premise is that, um, the, you know, I, I am questioning the assumption that providing money for community led initiatives is necessarily positive for all people at all scales. And so, the first element of this um, is uh, to do with timeframes. So when somebody dreams up uh, an initiative to change lifestyles and behaviours in their community, the time frame of that has got to be years and years and years. There's no way, I mean, we, you can't change communities in a year or two years. Um, but if you're applying for funding, you need output normally within a year. And so in order to apply, you have to set your goals for a year's time, um, goals that are tangible, um, and that for the CCF, they have to be carbon terms. So you have to say you're going to save this many tons of carbon. So that dictates what you can and can't do. Um, it means that you can only do relatively superficial things, or you can do infrastructure things. But you can't do a lot around behaviour change in that time. Um, and it means that, from from that, uh, because of that, it means that uh, local people, the, the rest of the community, start to understand that groups like this don't stick around very long because they have a couple of years of funding. Um, the funding dries up, they, they then have ended what they were doing. And so uh, one girl was just saying, you know, I, uh, I hope they're still here, but I've, I've seen it before and they probably they won't be. And another guy was much more cynical and he was saying, they won't be here, you know, give it five or six years and they'll be gone. So what's the point of me really um, investing anything in this? Um, they won't be around. Um, the thing that comes along with that is that if you only have short-term funding, you can only provide short-term employment. And so, as I was saying, uh, they tend to be um, um, dominated by incomers, and that's because a lot of people who move in maybe are more affluent than they've because they've retired or uh, for kind of the good life, and they have a bit of money behind them, and maybe they don't need 
um, a regular income or they, they can risk not having a job next year. Um, and this was when I was there because the, the island group, they only had their funding up until March of this year and they were reapplying for funding and in order to fit with the money that was being provided, they cut someone's job out of it. And the girl who was actually doing the application cut her own job out of it for next year. And you know, someone was asking her, what are you going to do? She was like, I don't know, it'll be all right, I'm going to be fine, but I have no idea what I'm going to do next year. And so if you were somebody who needed a job next year, then you wouldn't be able to be involved. So it, is, um, so it's, it's, it excludes some people. And so it just starts to make me question, you know, are they really um, as uh, you know, open to participants as maybe they could be. Um, it's not equal necessarily for everyone to be involved. Um, and yeah, here, yeah, so it's, this is just saying um, people do notice that it's posh people who are running these things um, because uh, some of the local people don't have the Okay, so the second thing uh, that comes along with funding is admin. Um, and so if you apply for funding, first thing, the application process is pretty demanding. It requires a, a degree of knowledge and experience of how you, how you fill in these forms. It need, you, you need to know that they exist even, so you need to be in a certain network to even realise that this money is available. Um, it also means that certain types of people who maybe are skilled at writing forms or who enjoy doing this kind of paperwork um, it, apply, and they, the ones who are more skilled at it get the money rather than necessarily than the people who are the most deserving. So there could be somebody who's extremely good at on the ground face-to-face uh, -face engagement, not very good at filling in a form, doesn't get the money. Um, so again, this just makes me think, is this the most, is this the fairest way of, of giving out money? Um, and so then, once you've got the money, there's then uh, continual pressure throughout the year to keep reporting back. You have to provide um, certain reports throughout the year. Um, and it means that you, a lot of the time, like I said, I was in the office most of the time, that's because most of the time, the group is in the office, either on the phone or emailing or writing reports, um, and they're not face-to-face -face with the rest of the community. When I designed my methodology, the idea was that I would link up with one of these groups, and then I would go out into the community with them, meet everyone in the community that they interacted with, and get kind of uh, my data through those people, but it ended up not being that. It ended up being kind of a much more in-depth scrutiny of how the CCF group itself operates. Um, because they didn't have this face-to-face -face, um, interaction. And it, it affects the way the community sees them, because obviously that there's not a lot of visual uh, visuals for them to see. Um, so here she's saying it's just the garden, that's the only thing that the community see, otherwise we don't know what they do. Um, and here, uh, a guy who'd written a letter who was saying, I, I don't understand why you've given so much money to this group. Um, they haven't done anything more than they could have done just by talking to people. Why haven't they just talked to people? Um, which, to be fair to them, I, you know, they did try and do, but uh, they didn't, they, they, they did a lot of paperwork so at the end of the time. Um, so, yep. Uh, then the third thing that comes along with uh, funding is uh, how that is perceived by the rest of the community. So, when a local person sees uh, half a million pounds being pumped into his community, um, but he sees no benefit from it, it starts to build, he starts to maybe uh, have some kind of resentment towards the group. So this was an email somebody sent me, again, out of the blue, this was nothing, I didn't, I didn't even know this guy. He found out I was doing this research and he got my email address <laughs> and emailed me and said, um, you shouldn't, you need to know this group isn't as good as they think they are. A lot of people will think that they're um, basically pretending to be very benevolent, but actually they're uh, quite calculating and business minded. Um, and so he, he thought it was very unfair what was happening. Um, also, because of the fact that a lot of these people are incomers, um, Sassanax, that's a Gallic word for like English person. So, um, here, or not even, I think it's just, yeah, well, uh, someone not from the islands. So, um, people kind of actually say to their faces, it's not fair, you're coming up here and getting all our money, getting the jobs, why don't, why don't they come to local, why doesn't it come to local people? And so, because of this income on the local, uh, kind of divide within the community group. It means that, you know, by the by the community group not uh, by the community group apparently getting more money than the local people, then it kind of deepens the divide between the two, um, which is a little dangerous. And then the fourth and final um, thing that comes along with uh, funding 
is that it turns community groups into competitive organisations. So instead of everyone getting together and thinking, well, what can we do about this? It becomes a fight for funds. And so this was uh, an interview I did with a, a woman whose a job title was, I think, community coordinator or something for the local authority. And her entire job was to try and get people to talk to each other, was to try and get them to work together. And she said, a lot of the time that's impossible because uh, they, they keep their cards close to their chest, they don't want to let... So she'll go and she'll say, oh, like, what's happening, what do you think you're doing? And they don't want to tell her in case she goes to another group and says, oh, yeah, that group's doing that. And then they steal their idea and get the money and they want the money. And so there's this real battle for kind of who has the authority to deliver certain things and therefore gets the money for it, which is interesting. Um, also, it means that people are doing the same thing um, in order, and, and not working together, like kind of working in opposite directions but on the same project. Um, so that they get more money. And so uh, there was one example when I was there, which was that they were um, starting up a local, the group I was with wanted to start up a community radio station. And it was all very exciting. And they'd started a Facebook group and blah, blah, blah. It's great. And then I went about a month later and had a meeting with another community group. And they were starting up a radio station. And they had absolutely no idea that they were both doing this. And then I, so I just came back to my group and I said, Do you know that they're doing a radio station? And they said, No. I couldn't tell them any of my ideas, did you? No one can tell me the ideas, but you should work together, you know, it's one, one community, one radio station, but it um, doesn't work like that. Um, and equally, this guy was talking to you, uh, talking about development offices. So within the island, which had a well, within the, the stream of islands, which altogether had a population of about 3,000 people, they had 35 development offices, all with the same remit of developing the community. They didn't work together, they worked independently. And so this guy was saying, <coughs> they're all being paid a salary, he took all of that money, had one development officer and then put the rest of the money into infrastructure or he was involved in the fishing industry so he was really interested in kind of improving the fishing industry like trying to give it a bit of a brand name or something so it would be much better for the islands um, in terms of sustainability to do that rather than invest in these development officers. So okay so that's the end of that paper. So this is just my other emergent ideas. So there you go. So the first one is called the chicken or the egg. I'm quite into my titles, I spent quite a lot of time with your ideas. Um, and this one is really um, about whether uh, a pre-existing community starts a community group which represents the whole community and then does something on sustainability, or whether an actual group starts up to do something on community and that for uh, sorry to do something on sustainability and that forms a community. So it's not necessarily the same community that is uh, forming the group that they are geographically meant to represent, if that makes any sense. So, for example, the CCF groups are not a community, are not a representative of a whole community in which they are supposed to represent. Instead, they are definitely a community, but they're a community that spreads across, so into the Scottish Government, into other community groups, um, and it's, it's a very strong network and they do a lot of good stuff, but it's slightly misleading to say that um, that the community is the geographic community and it can actually cause resentment so people like i was saying with the funding so if people think this money is supposed to be for their community but it's not coming to them then it makes them resent this group whereas if there was some way of defining the, this community-led group as a community in itself then maybe that would solve some of those issues um so yeah so that's something i'm trying to work through at the moment just kind of like the construction of community coming from the funding rather than the community already existing and getting the funding. Um, and then the second one is kind of this idea of the white settler. And so while I was in both communities, uh, the, the, the kind of um, history of a white settler, which is somebody coming in, well, I don't know how much you know about Scottish rural history, but they have a, quite a tumultuous history with people coming in and kicking them off of their land. And it, there's quite a lot of... Um, not aggression, but like, um, <laughs> I don't know what the word is, but they're, they're very, they're very um, sure of themselves and they don't want people coming in and telling them what to do. And so this is very um, early in my development stages of this theory, but um, it's just to really kind of figure out whether a group run by incomers is counterintuitive to the whole idea of community-led uh, initiative. You know, do, does it matter that these groups are led by what are termed incomers by the rest of the community, and I, I don't know yet. Um, but it's, it's got a very interesting interplay with this idea of the white settler and um, whether this kind of long-standing history of 
resenting um, evil coming intent to do the effects that. So that's that one that's coming in the future. So my last bit of field work will be done in the next couple of months. Um, I'm going to go back to the two case studies and do some interviews with them and try and kind of explore these themes with them um, in a bit more detail. Um, also just to observe what's happened to the group. So the one that's lost funding, it'd be interesting to see what's happened to them um, over the last year or nine months. Um, and then also I'm going to do some interviews with the CCF. So I really want to understand why the CCF is set up, um, apart from political reasons, and um, whether they think the project, whether it's going well, whether they think it's, they're achieving their goals through the CCF. I mean, they must to a certain extent because they've continued the funding. Um, I kind of also unpick my themes with uh, project officers, which are kind of people who are more on the ground and are communicating with the, um, the group themselves. So that's it. Very much indeed. There's a lot of food for thought there, so I'd like to kick off with, with any comments. I've certainly got some more food. Thanks very much, I mean, really, really interesting. Um, just, it seems to me that the uh, an interesting question you're raising is how do you define the community? So we're talking about a geographic community, but then what you'd said was even then, if you're including incomers and locals, even then that isn't a community, you know, outside of the, the, the project work. Yeah. Um, so have you had any thoughts about what, what, what would you define as a community? <laughs> um, no, I mean I've obviously done a lot of reading, there's a lot of literature on trying to define what a community is. I think it's pretty much impossible to define, to kind of have a universal definition of a community. I think it absolutely depends on who's involved. There's some music coming out. I think um, the idea that it's just networks, you know, uh, kind of relationships between people, between a set number of people, I think that's really what makes a community. So the groups themselves, I think, are communities because they are achieving something through the networks that they have, but it's not the same. And I think that there are geographical communities. I think you can say this is a community. It's just a different type of community to maybe the CCF group. And so it's, it's not necessarily, it's not, I don't know how, it's so hard to put it into words, but um, I think just by living next door to somebody, you do have some kind of shared identity and some sense of local community, um, especially in these rural areas, I think that is true, I mean, it's, it's much more distinct, you know, maybe you live in a city and the definition of your community is quite hard because it's so sprawling, whereas in both of these areas, they, they knew the boundary of their geographic community. Um, but even within that, so the island is particularly interesting because there's the Gallic community, which is a different community to the island community, which is a different community to the church community. So there's the Catholic community and then there's the Protestant community, and it's all they're all the same island community. But then within them, there's sub communities. So the short answer is no, I don't know the definition of community, but it is something that I will explore in depth in my thesis. Um, but I don't think I'm going to get anywhere <laughs> very concrete. <laughs> yeah, what I was interested in. In like, well, it was very interesting. But um, particularly with like the the funding and the groups and stuff, like what sort of groups do you have applying for funding? So that's like really big amounts, which makes me think that it's more sort of it's like well established groups. And then also like, who decides who gets the funding? Is it just like sort of the government or or are people like those um like development officers? Are they factored into because obviously they know the area or, or anything like that? Or is it all just a couple of um, basically, with the funding, you can apply, they say you can apply from um, as little as £100 up to a million pounds. But uh, this year, originally there was much more small projects, so maybe uh, you know £1,000 for an installation project. But this round of funding, they've actually really focused on big projects. I think they've decided that um, they get more tangible output from you know, putting, giving lots of money to fewer projects. And so they've got a few kind of like half a million pound projects. Um, but these guys who've had quite a lot is because they've had more than one year of funding. So they've got, the group has had 600,000, they've had three rounds of funding. So it was, you know, 100,000 the first time. And, then, um, and the way that it's decided is as a panel. So there's, I think, about seven or eight people who uh, get all the applications. What, what happens is each group that's applying gets assigned a project officer from the CCF who comes and discusses their application with them and tells them whether they've got any hope of getting this money and helps them kind of um, make their application better. Then the application gets submitted to a panel who then review all of them over two days or something, they sit in a room and they read all of them and the project officer um, is supposed to kind of promote that project so they're kind of like the representative of that group and um, 
then they just decide which ones they think are the best for the CCF. I don't know how, I mean that's something I need to talk to the CCF about how they decide which ones are the best. Who's on the panel? Various people, so um, experts, I don't know, academics, I think there's an Okay, so it's all, but it's all, all, all tie level, it's not... Oh yeah, people. there's no, there's no uh, community people. No community people. Do you think that like that level, like because you're saying that the admin demands placed on the groups are so high, does, does that put people off at all? Do you think? Yeah, I mean the thing, the problem I have is that I have only spoken to people who have money, so um, it's quite difficult to find people who have been put off by applying like, because of the admin because they obviously don't have the money, so I don't know who they are. So, but I think it it must put people off. It would put me off. I mean, it's it's a lot. If you've never applied for anything, I mean people who literally, you know, they just are doing stuff in their community, they've never applied for any money before. It's a really complex thing to do. You have to do budgets and figure out, you know, salaries and things and tax and all this kind of stuff. And you have to put it all into your application. It's not just about, you know, write a paragraph, what you want to do. It's very... But I'm guessing, is that then where, like, the project officer would become really invaluable in terms of supporting them through that process? Yeah, I guess. I mean, I guess that's the idea, but I, I don't know how many groups get put off before that stage because you do have to submit an application before you even get a project officer to come in. So you have to have done something for them to... And do you think this amount of like feedback work they have to do is almost undermining them? The, the, um, the, like, yeah. If they're not having the, the behaviour change, it's not coming out of it. Yeah, I think so. I personally think so, because the, what the, the feedback they want is on carbon savings. So they want you to calculate the carbon saving and send it in. And that, I mean, that's ridiculous for some things. I mean, if you're saying I'm trying to change attitudes in my community and get people to grow, grow more lettuces or whatever, it's impossible to calculate realistically what the carbon saving is. But there probably I mean there undoubtedly will be some indirect carbon saving, but it's oh, it's a joke to try and calculate that, I think. So is that the only measure of success that they have? Um no, not officially, but it is it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah that's everyone. I mean that's the one for the government. I mean that's why the SMP supports it because that's their carbon saving strategy mm. at a local level. So they do say oh we want to build community, you know, it's a way of building community, but that isn't their priority, their priority is carbon saving. Mm -hmm. okay. That was really interesting, thank you very much, and it's, it's raised a whole lot of thoughts for me, partly actually to do, I, I want you to work in international development, right? and I have to say, everything you're saying can also, it's sort of lessons I think that come out, also working right. in the international context, yeah. you know, Also, uh, in those sort of situations about short term funding horizons and the fiction that one has to create of the story of you know, success, etc., etc., which um, often measured against targets which don't actually be a very relevant to the actual projects on the ground, the issue yeah. of participation and ownership, who's actually determining what the project is, etc., etc., etc. I think are very familiar stories right. here in the international setting. Um, but I also, um, I, mean, I think, in terms of my own research around trans transition. I, I, mean, I think what's, what you were saying about the experience of community and groups who are applying, quite a few of those I spoke to in transition had decided not to apply for funding for the, some of the very reasons that you talk, mm -hmm. talked about, about the administration. And actually, fit, and I think the transition network itself, which is a kind of overarching body, has tried to encourage a lot of transition initiatives to go through some crowdsourcing and yeah. other ways of trying to fund these funds for projects because of sometimes for finding it quite onerous. But also I think uh, mentioning the issue about competition is saying is this really promoting the kind of collaborative cross community sort of um, approach that we would, we would like yeah. and etc. Et et so I think those, those are kind of issues. Yeah. I think another issue is as you say um, the aspect of how representative is the initiative group um, of the community in which they come and certainly, uh, and I remember one in particular interview saying, so, you know, we, you know, we can't claim to be representative, we're not. Yeah. They're coming with a very particular agenda and I suppose one of the kind of things I'm looking at is the kind of cultural politics that you can't, that there's a very particular sort of lifestyles that some of these groups are promoting that for some people is not at all what they necessarily want. So of course there's a cultural politics in here, and you can't pretend <coughs> to bring everybody along with the community. Yet at the same time, that is of course what a lot of groups are wanting to do, exactly. and they are wanting to build a community, but as you say, it's a very particular kind of community. Yeah, community. yeah. well that's particular, I, I find that interesting because it's the kind of the purpose of the group is to change the community, but because they're supposed to represent the community, 
uh, they kind of have to, if they represent the community, they have to have the same desires and beliefs of the community, but then if they're trying to shift those desires and beliefs, then they can't represent the existing community because they're trying to move it to a new fra you know, framework. So it's, it's a very difficult space that they fill. And in my paper I'm, I'm writing, you know, that actually the groups themselves don't know where they fit in, within all this because they're not representative of the community, but then they're not representative of, of anything else. You know, they kind of float in this strange position that's completely undefined. And so I think that's really what I'm calling for is maybe a more accurate reframing of what these groups what these groups are and what they're trying to do. And maybe calling them community led is the wrong thing or you you know you need to maybe redefine that and make it more explicit. I think, I think the trouble is that if you say the the kind of policy context is such that you put, if you start bringing up the kind of politics that are happening at the local level around it, that actually you endanger the funding, so there's a, difficult, there's a chicken and egg aspect of you say if you actually rely on funds for existence, which not all community groups do, as I say, but, um, but I think a lot, that's the traditional model of creating um, of, of project yeah. running, etc, etc, et so yeah, mm -hmm. it is a difficult one. Yeah, it is. It's interesting to think of the rationale that Scottish doesn't have when they, they set this up. Yeah. Lurking behind this analysis is the idea that it might be a kind of romantic concept of community driving urban policy makers who think that there's some kind of fairy dust in, in yeah. rural communities which means there's an automatic level of built-in propensity to collaborate and to work in a unified way, which yeah. really isn't true. Yeah. I mean, before I went in, you know, I had my idea that I was going to these community groups and they would all be so happy and benevolent and I wasn't expecting to find any kind of, you know, malicious thoughts involved, but it's the opposite, you know, actually. You know, and, and talking to people, they say, well, of course, it's a very claustrophobic environment, you're stepping on people's toes, it's a joke to think that everyone gets along perfectly and everyone wants the same thing, and so I think it's definitely that, you know, this romantic idea of community has is, is kind of taken over the policy makers' brains, and they want to apply it to everything, and it's not always the best way to go. And also the idea of representativeness is, is, is as you said, very, very problematic, so if you're trying to get an innovation developed, most of those arise from quite niche groups, which very gradually and in a very contested way find their way into the mainstream yeah. over a long time. But the one thing they aren't, by virtue of being an innovative niche, is, it, is representative. Yeah. So demanding community represent, representativeness is, is a kind of paradox mm. built into this from the start. Yeah. Mm. Please. You said that it was a double-edged sword. What yes. are the real benefits and good things that you've seen? Well, yes. without money, a lot of these groups wouldn't exist at all. And I don't want to say these, these groups do good stuff. I mean, they have saved Parliament and they have um, done interesting trials and things. Without the money, they wouldn't have been able to do it. And so, they, of course, money does bring benefits. You know, it employs people in these areas where there's low employment. Um, it brings jobs, which is important. Um, and good green jobs, you know, it's not jobs in oil or, or something else that they might be doing. And so, um, in that sense, I mean, there are obviously obviously tangible benefits, but I think that different projects could have existed in those areas without funding. And so, and just as good projects probably, without the kind of capital investment in infrastructure, both of them have quite um, kind of done part of building and things, you know, they've built greenhouses or refurbished that whole building. and. It's not necessarily the most, the best way to change lifestyles. If that's what they're trying to do, change people's mindsets and ways of living, I don't think that's necessarily. I think if you could get people to volunteer, or if you could somehow, you know, have a more equal way of contributing to the change, you know. So why why does one volunteer for free? Well, I think that's the problem: is that people see people being paid to do it, but then the people who are being paid are asked are asking people to do it for free. And so it doesn't seem fair, whereas if it was people doing it for free, asking people to join them to do it for free, I, in my mind I think that might work better in terms of getting people to change their mindsets. Um, but no, there are definitely benefits to funding, I think. You know, you can buy stuff with money, you can buy people with money, you know. How about a system in which no one was paid, so it was all volunteers, yeah. but there was money for capital improvement? Yeah, I think that would probably be better. Mm. Mm. Just just going back again to the thing about like collaboration and competition, because I was a bit surprised by that. I would have thought, did you not 
Was there not any cases of where groups that have similar ideas would work together to strengthen their application and then like have a broader scope and work in a bigger area? Mm. Not really, not that I came yeah. across because um, people are scared of people stealing their ideas. Yeah. Like it really was like that. And I think um, they can always get more money by doing it separately. And so one group can employ three people, another group can employ three people, whereas if they got together they can employ three people overall. And so I think they tend to do that. There wasn't really much um, evidence of people working. I didn't see any groups that had come together to do an application. Um, and actually the, the one kind of collaborative thing I did see was um, Oxfam actually had come to the island to try and get the group to link up with Govan, which is in Glasgow. It's a very uh, poor area of Glasgow. And they wanted them to work together because Govan was like an island in the city. <laughs> this was an, island, an actual island and they wanted them to work together. And, stuff. and they just found it extremely patronising and very um, not useful to work together in that way. And so I, yeah, I mean, I, that was the only <laughs> example. And everyone just said, no thanks. We're not interested. Thanks, Oxfam. Bye. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so no, they didn't really. <laughs> which, yeah, it's probably a surprising. And and then to do with like time frame, you need to have sort of like from your reading as well as sort of research, like to have any impact in terms of behaviour change. It's, it's like, extremely difficult have, to measure. Yeah. Like, there isn't really a way of measuring behaviour change um, yet. Uh, not not one that I know of anyway. And, and like also the time scale of um, the change. I mean, are you talking about a change in a year or ten years or twenty years? I mean, maybe these people who've been involved now in ten years' time will be living different lives, but where do you start a measurement and stop your measurement? And you'd have to kind of uh, do some kind of measurement of some before they start, and then at the end, uh, yeah, it's just not measured at the moment. And that is, I think that's a very pressing need, is a more, is a, is a way of measuring behaviour change, so we don't have it at the moment. Um, you are also need a way of measuring the source of the motivation, exactly. the because um, one thing that strikes me in this is that one influential view of behaviour change is that it comes about through people modelling behaviour with which they regard as desirable in, in others yeah. who they would identify with in, in some way. But the paradox here is that if you have quite successful behaviour change amongst the income group, which seems like the most likely thing, that's precisely what wouldn't be modelled amongst the, yeah. the local group. Yeah, the, 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 the group council doesn't have group and resist yeah. much easier if they can be cast Lots of really juicy paradoxes mm. here. Um, yeah. what, would be, what would be fascinating would be to hear from you next year about the reactions of the Scottish government, yeah. policymakers, and the, the designers of the fund to these sorts of findings and how, the, how they might go about rethinking it. One thing that strikes me you've got a lot of scope with the, the next phase to you know, not, not do another in depth study but go more further afield and, and look at other groups and funders. Is it part of your plan to go to one or more communities? who are doing projects a bit like this, but without official funding. Yeah, I would like maybe to. maybe there's different ownership structures going on. Yeah, I would like to. It's quite, like I was saying, it's quite difficult to find those groups mm -hmm. um, who, are, who are doing stuff under the radar. Um, but yeah, hopefully through word of mouth, I'll, mm -hmm. I will be able to. And also, the fact that the island group has lost funding, it'll be interesting to see what they're now doing, how they've changed and evolved with the kind of trying to survive without. Because I know they still exist, but I don't know what they're actually doing, yeah, yeah. you know, their website's no longer yeah. up to date because they've got no one yeah. paid to do it anymore. So, um, yeah. yeah, it'll be interesting to see how they evolve. And is there a rural Scotland transition network? Oh, yeah, yeah. Is, that could be, you know, maybe, maybe there is comparators there which would be worth yeah. looking at. Yeah, so I think that's what will be interesting, at least from what I don't know, um, I have a, I may, I know somebody who is working in that work in Scotland, um, but I don't know enough about what they're doing, but I know that, for instance, if I was in England, that, I mean, and also in other parts, again, my sense is that transition has developed something in the identity of being very white, very middle class, very, yeah. um, and, um, and probably very English. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. So I, would, I wouldn't be surprised if they're seeing such effects. Yeah. I mean, even in a, in a rural, where it's um, a voluntary, yeah. which may be a real, and that sounds to me like a real core mm -hmm. issue yeah. here. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and um, but one one of the things that I, I might be an interesting is that, for instance, Edinburgh will talk more than yeah um, is I think at least present that those who, who set that up very much present themselves as a very much an alternative. They were comparing themselves to a, a local transition a transition within that area where they were saying 
we are not perceived, at least that's how they were presented, as, as this very middle class, very outsider, um, uh, outsider group who come in to yeah. do, um, do some of the And I think it might be interesting to see if you can find some uh, oh, right. some groups like that, particularly yeah. there are in Scotland. Is Incredible Edible, is, is, it, uh, hmm? is Incredible Edible like a, a chain of things? Is it just the one? Or it's, it's, there's one, it's, one. Total, it's Todd Morgan. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's, it's becoming a sort of brand, isn't it? Within yeah, I think it's a big brand. Yeah. Yeah. There's one or two, I think, right. trying to set something. Yeah. 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 Yeah.